Good evening, church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Colin, the pulpit minister here at Central Church of Christ. And this is Dan Spate. He's one of our elders. And here at Central Church of Christ, it's our mission to be God's heart and hands in this community and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about what that means, I want to encourage you to head over to our website at www.churchvictoria.com. This is our Wednesday evening conversation through the law and the prophets where we open up the Old Testament, we move through the narrative and the text, and we see how it impacts us today as the church and how it how that text connects to Jesus. Um, if you're listening to this on the Heart and Heads podcast. I want to thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you have the bell turned on so you get notified every time we upload a video. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure to like and share. That really helps us out. And make sure to comment down below. Um, if this ministry has blessed you or you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, I want, I want to encourage you to head over to that website. At the top of the page, we have a donate button that uh, take, will take you to PayPal, and you can partner with us as we seek to teach and preach the gospel. Uh, we're going to pray and get into the lesson. Again, church, thank you so much for joining us. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Yep. Yeah. Father in heaven, we uh, are grateful for the opportunity we have to study together. We pray your blessings upon us as we as we go through the text. We pray, Father, that you uh, be with us, that we might have the courage to apply these things and, and really pay attention to what's going on here and what uh, and try to figure out uh, what who you are and what you what you're about. And we and we thank you for the opportunity. Bless us, Father, as we do this, and bless all who will watch and will uh, and will strive to uh, to listen to us. Uh, over the over how whatever time frame and we thank you for them as well bless them as well father in jesus name we pray amen, amen. all right okay so we are in leviticus we're down here to the end we're almost to the end almost we're almost got it almost maybe there. we'll get rolling we'll get finished today <laughs> okay you think no i don't i don't, I don't think, think so we'll be done. Wait, wait we might finish it out i don't know all i right. don't think we'll get through 26 so right we're going <laughs> so um you know so last week we we looked at what is eventually going to become the first part of the covenant of blessings and cursings right mm -hmm. and it, there was a lot of blessing there there was mm -hmm. a lot of the lord said you know look if you if you actually uphold the covenant obligations if you actually demonstrate your faith through the, this loyalty and actually do the things that i've asked you to do and and make the sacrifices you know i'm gonna i'm gonna be your god and i'm gonna bless you and um you know, it's, we're going to take care of you. We're going to do all these things. I think if you look at the overall general theme of what it's saying, chapter 26 is saying, is, uh, you know, and what amazes me is, is God knows what they're going to do. Right. He already knows. We've talked about this before. You know, I'm looking at it and saying, why didn't he just annihilate them? Because he knows they're not going to, they're not going to be obedient to this. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do this, you know, straight out of the box. They're not going to do this. Uh, and we've already talked about it, and he's going to get frustrated to the point he's going to give them laws they can't do. Let me ask you, why do you think you're right? They're not going to do this, mm -hmm. and that's that's heavily established. Mm -hmm. Do you think, it's a two-part question, do you think the members of the church today think they can do it? And if they do, why? Think they can do, that they can be faithful? or they That they can keep the law. Oh, <laughs> You do you know. think members of the church today are running around trying to keep a law? And if they are, why? I think they're running around trying to keep a law, okay. a a set of, of do's and don'ts. Not necessarily the law that was given here, because they know that's not going to happen, because they, you know, many of them know about the bloodletting and all that. But I think that many people today, not just in the church, but everywhere, have this idea that, uh, that God is going to be pleased with me checking off things and doing things that that I believe he wants me to do that I believe that he that he that will make him happy if it makes me happy then if going to church on Sunday makes me feel better about myself then God must be okay with it and it must be good if I doesn't make any difference what I do there as long as it makes me feel good about what I'm doing and so I think that people have a, a tendency to to say you know what I'm gonna I, I, I'll I'll make sure that I check these boxes off and I get this done. And I think that it's a, uh, I think it becomes a law unto, our, unto ourselves. And I think the world's like that. Uh, I, well, I'm a really good person. Well, I've obeyed the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they, they, they create a new law for themselves. 
not necessarily the law, but they create a new law for themselves. And uh, if I'm really good at keeping it, then God must love me. He mm -hmm. has to love me because I've been really good at keeping it. Uh, I haven't done a really good job all the time, but I'm really pretty good at it. So God must love me. If you if you ask people, and I ask them, sure. in fact, my Bible study tonight is going to be, you know, it, uh, do you believe you're going to heaven? And if so, why? Why do you believe that? Right. And because I've done this, this, and this, or because I'm because God loves me and He's and He's set out parameters for me to live as His child. You know, but uh, I think that it's I think that it's it's uh, it's it's very sad that we have whole churches, whole denominational groups that are that are formed on this idea that that if I do enough stuff, God's going to love me. Mm. If I if I'm if I'm really good at it, good enough at it, or just mediocre at it, God's still going to love me. Yeah. And and I think that, that Do you think some of that comes from passages like this? I think I think it comes from the leadership uh perpetuating that mon that nonsense that mindset leadership as a whole from secular leadership to spiritual leadership sure. uh, if i if i obey pretty close the laws of the land they won't stop and give me a ticket hmm. okay you know i mean i mean the speed limit is 65 miles an hour but most of them say well we don't usually give tickets unless it's 11 miles over unless it's in a school zone or unless it's in a hospital, you know, and and if I catch you with your in your phone, you know, in a school zone, you're not supposed to be on your phone in a school zone in the state of Texas. Well, but if I catch you, you know, and it's and you're driving pretty good, I probably won't give you a ticket. This is what I've heard from cops. Mm -hmm. So is that not perpetuating the mindset mm -hmm. that that laws are good, but we'll pick and choose the laws. Mm -hmm. We'll pick and choose how we obey the laws. And so you bring that mindset in the church. Well, everybody else is singing. They don't really need me singing because I really can't carry a tune in a bucket. So I'm not going to sing. I'll sit there. I'll sit there and enjoy or listen or just be furious because they're not singing the songs I like. Mm. And and uh, or I will uh, I'll go to church sometimes. And and I'll and I'll pick the days because God really wants me to good, be a good parent. He wants me to be a good father. And so if I if I go if I go with my family to the beach, it's a spiritual endeavor, and it's a good replacement for church. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, that that's just so you can take this can of worms, open it up, and have them crawl out all over every place like an octopus, man. And that's just the way it is. You know, nobody holds up the book and says. Do I believe what this says, and I will, am I willing to apply it to my life? And if the answer is yes, then what's the first thing I need to do? Open it. Say, okay, let's start reading. And not necessarily that I'm going to be obedient to this law, but what am I going to find as I read through the whole thing? You know, that's why I have people, when I, have them, when I want to study with them, start reading Matthew and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. Because you're going to find out what Jesus says about all this stuff. I don't have to navigate it. Let, let me let Jesus tell me what to do with it. Right. You know what did he say? He can sum up the law in two two separate commands: yeah. love God with everything you have and love your neighbor yeah. like yourself. That's it. Yeah. That sums up the whole law. Yeah. You know, well, it doesn't. It does. It says that, but it's obscure. You have to go find it. What it, it what it says is, well, you can't eat this kind of fish. You can't eat that kind of fish. You can't eat that kind of animal. Better not have sex with an animal. But having to have sex with the same guy, the same sex partner, you know that all that stuff—it's all in there. And God says, "Love God with everything you have, right? And then love your neighbor like yourself." And so we we miss the principle, and we end up living under rules, yeah, and checking off boxes, absolutely. And then we forget that we forget that it's the blood of Christ. Jesus. It's God's mercy. It's his grace that mm -hmm. gives us these things, not us Absolutely. checking off the boxes. The checking off the boxes is a supposed to be a placeholder for the immature who don't understand how to love God yeah. and love your brother. And when Jesus came on the scene and he becomes an adult, starts his ministry, and he finds this mindset within the community right. of Israel, what does he call them? Pharisees. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what he calls them. 
And what does he call the Pharisees? A bunch of whitewashed walls full of dead men's bones. That's what he tells them. Right. Because they're they're so keen on on you know, it even said, you know, you've heard it say that Moses said, okay, give them a certificate of divorce. What did it say? You know, not to do this. Yeah. But because you wouldn't obey it, okay, just here, give them a certificate of divorce. But God hates divorce. Well, if I love God, then I'm gonna hate what God hates. Right? You would think. You would think, but that's not way, the way we that we've been. That, and I watch, I watch, you know, preachers quote preachers all the time. Watch all kinds of stuff, and I'm amazed at at how easily they can twist the text to make it fit their narrative. It's amazing to watch. If you know the narrative, you know the book, and you and you understand the narrative doesn't fit the book. It's amazing how they take the scripture and fit it to fit, the, fit it to the narrative. Yeah. It's amazing. That's why so many people are lost. Well, I, to to some extent, you know, we see a lot of people doing that. It's not just preachers. It's I mean, even uh, of course, yeah. But where do we learn it from? Where do we learn how to be thieves and liars from a thief and a liar? <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. You know, where did <laughs> where did even Adam learn to to be? I want to be like God because Satan told him to. He deceived him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so where do we where do we get this from? We get it from we get it from people above us. We get it from mom and dad. We get it from grandma and grandpa. We get it from from uh, state government, county government, you know, federal government. We we learn it from the upper echelon, and then and then sadly, we learn this from our spiritual leadership as well. Yeah. And that's when it said then you have then that's when you have whole oh, and Paul said. There's going to be people come a time, he told Timothy, there's going to come a time when people are going to heap to themselves teachers that will tickle their ears. Tell them what they want to hear. Right. Because we've gotten so used to this now, now I'm not going to stand for anybody that's going to tell me something different. I was watching, uh, I was watching a fairly popular um, group, news media group, a conservative media group, and they were talking about uh, the law and Exodus and stuff like that. And, and one of them, you know, one of them... This made, was secular? News or, or was it a yeah I mean it's secular news but it's conservative okay um and anyway one one of the individuals you know and it was just like a, a brief it was supposed to be like a uh, it was supposed to be like a, a ad for the, the the show and one of the individuals they read off the the passage out of Exodus where God says you know if you keep my my commandments right I will be your God and I will be your people and he says and this is why I don't believe in unconditional love. And I thought that was an that was a, a rather amazing statement to make in Exodus 19, right? So in other words, what he's saying is unconditional love doesn't exist because um, it's conditional. God is only our God if we do what he says. If we don't do what he, he says, then he's not our God, right? He doesn't love us, all of these things, right? And I thought that was a really interesting statement because if you just give the narrative a bit because they're reading that passage out of exodus 19. if you give it a little bit exodus 19 exodus 20. if you give it a little bit and wait till you get to exodus 32 the people of israel don't do what he says no, no, you know no. they don't they don't follow his I commands know, know. and this and look at what it says here in 40. Mm -hmm. right so he's already said like if they're not going to do what i say Right. If, if if you do what I say, you'll be blessed. If you don't do what I say, you don't do what you're supposed to be doing, and you follow after other gods, and you do all sorts of shenanigans. I'm gonna throw you off my land. It's my land. It's not your land. I'm giving it to you, but it's really mine, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna kick you off it if you're gonna be a bad tenant. Right? Yep. God's already said that. So look what He says in verse verse 40. But if they confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile toward them so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember the land. It's really interesting. He doesn't say, I will remember the covenant with Moses. He doesn't say no, that. He goes all the way back to the covenant with Abraham. Yeah. That's interesting. There's a guy in the New Testament named Paul who's going to do that in the book of Galatians yeah. and in the book of Romans. And he's going to talk about why the promise and the covenant, the promise enshrined in covenant to Abraham is superior to the law of Moses. So we're going to, we're, 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 where we're going to be uh, in, on Wednesday night in Galatians 3. God goes all the way back to Abraham. And this is the same appeal that Moses made in Exodus 32 after they had done the shenanigans with the golden calf. You know, they just 
consecrated the covenant. Moses goes up onto the mountaintop. The, Moses is up there for 40 days and 40 nights. The people are down below, and they're, it's like a month and a half, not even, you know, a, a month and it may it's just, you know, five weeks, six weeks, and they're sitting there, and there are all that stuff going on top of the mountain, and they're like, yeah, we know what happened to Moses. Well, you yeah, know, we know what happened to God. I think what <laughs> we have to understand is, is the covenant that he gives to Moses was for a predetermined time to a predetermined people. For a predetermined purpose. Yes. That's all it was for. Right. That's why it's so important that he goes back to Abraham and says, because the promise was for all time. It was for all people. The law was not. No. It, it was only for the Jews for a specific time and purpose. That's right. That was it. And then once that purpose was done, once that time frame was fulfilled, and when Jesus said, it's finished, it's done, it, it was over. Because he ushered in the new covenant that that we're that's talked about in Jeremiah thirty one, you know, and all of this that we're talking about, and you know, I mean, I want you guys to understand that this doesn't have anything to do with us. This no. shows us God and shows us how God reacts and how God acts, but it has nothing to do with us. What has to do with us is the covenant that was given to Abraham. That's right. Because in Galatians three it says we become heirs according to the promise, not according to the covenant. Right. We become heirs according to the promise. And what was the promise? The promise that was given to Abraham all that nations all nations will be blessed through him, through his. And he and he tells him in Galatians three, says, and he said, and the promise was about his seed, his seed, and that seed was Christ. That's, right. That's what it says. It says it wasn't Ishmael. It wasn't that wasn't where the promise was coming from. It was coming through the seed of Abraham, through the seed of Sarah, through that union. Yeah. And it was going to come through Jesus. And he tells them, and when he sends them, what he says here, and he says, uh, uh, I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then, then, and then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin. I want to take you to a text. I'm going to give sure. Lee a little bit of time. Turn to Jeremiah 31. Hmm. Give Lee a little bit of time to catch up with us. But wait, I didn't. We didn't tell him this text was coming. Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one. Yeah. And then uh, hold it right there. Mm. There is a. Um, there is a text that he says early on mm, that that he is uh, that he is going to relent when they're when they when they seek after him with their, all their hearts, and I don't remember where that text is. It's somewhere in Jeremiah. But here, this is about the covenant in 31. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, and this covenant, this he's talking about the covenant to, with Abraham, not yeah. the covenant with Moses. He said, this is the covenant I will make with their people of Israel at, after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's not where this covenant of Moses is. It's written down. Yeah. Moses writes it down. It's not going to be written on their heart and their minds. And he said, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Yeah, that is That was not the case with the law of Moses. It was It was not. You know, I wish I could find that other text. Because what he, what he tells them, what he tells them in, in uh, when he sends them into that land, and he says, talks about when they're uncircumcised hearts, when they're humbled, he said, I, I'm not going to relent. You know, you go, you go do this, go ahead, go over there. In fact, you have no choice because they're going to take you there. Sennacherib is coming and the Syrian army is coming and they're going to take, and that's, we talked about this before when the land became desolate, they couldn't do anything. So they thought they would, had, had, had riled one of their gods. So he sends a priest back. And he said, talking about after the, after Israel has been taken captive into and, the and northern And taken to, been taken to Assyria. They, they become the, the Samaritans later on. But but he says, I'm not going to let you go back, you know. But And then when the southern kingdom goes into Babylon is when he tells them, that's when Jeremiah talks to them and says, says He's not gonna, you're not going back. You might as well get comfortable. Plant gardens, take wives, have children, build houses, because you're not coming home until you seek me with all of your heart. And that's what, that's what he says here. 
And he tells us that same thing throughout the text in the, in the New Testament. That's right. He wants us to humble ourselves. He wants us to come after him. He said, unless you hate your mother, your father, sister, and brother, you can't have no part of me. He said, I want everything you've got. That's right. I want it all. And I thought about it the other day. I thought, I thought, what does he really mean? And uh, when it says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I thought about my life. From the moment I wake up to the day I, time I go to sleep is geared around this and what we do in God. And it never was like that before. And I think that's that's what it's talking about. Yeah. I think when you become to the point where everything in your life is him and what he, you know, I, I pray numerous times in the day, you know, well, not numerous, but I'll pray a couple times a day. God, please help me to glorify you in what I'm doing mm -hmm. and whatever I'm going to do, help me, help it to be a glory to you. And an honor to you. That'll take that'll that'll take some of the starch out of the negativity. Mm. You know, it'll take some of the starch out of the anger and the and the rage and the and the discontent. It will. You know, but he said, he said, I want you to humble yourself. And and sometimes when God sends us off into the far country, it has a tendency to humble us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why he says in James 1, he said, he says, consider it pure joy when you face trials and tribulations of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Satan is not testing your faith. You know, he's trying to destroy your faith. That's right. Yeah. God's the one that's testing us. He tests, he's going to, you know, we'll get to some places where he says he's tested them in the wilderness. He tested them, you know, to see what they would do. He knows what they're going to do, but they need to, they need to grow. They need to mature. And, you know, you've been at this a short time mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there are things still that you have to learn that sure. you haven't learned yet that you'll learn through trial and error and through through uh, uh, through chaos. As simple as I can put it, you'll learn it through chaos mm -hmm. and, and whatever that means. But here, they, these folks, you know, they, they, are, they have no clue because they're going to elevate the law so much. They have no clue. Even today, I was listening to some Jews, and they, they don't go worship at the temple. Mm-mm. They don't sacrifice, but they're strict adherence to the law. No, you're not. I know. I know. Don't say that because you're not. If you're not going to, if God says, if you're going to obey one law, you yeah, got to obey, obey all of it. Yeah. Obey it all. And what God knows, they ain't going to be able to obey any of it. Well, we read in Ezekiel where he said, I gave you, I gave you laws that you couldn't obey. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting that he, he goes back when he, when he talks about, being merciful, and he talks about bringing them back and doing these things right. He, this is what he says. I remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham in Leviticus 26, 42. Mm -hmm. And then in 43, he says, For the land will be deserted by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord, their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, the laws, and the regulations that the Lord established at Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelites through Moses. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, that's not the end. It sounds kind of like it is the end, but there's still one more chapter in Leviticus 27. Uh, but this is it, right? So we yep. have the expectation. And what's and another th really interesting thing here is God is calling the shots historically all the way back here in Leviticus. Mm -hmm. So all the way back here in Leviticus, he has already told us what's exact, what is going to happen. Israel is going to continue to rebel even when they get into the land, they will eventually get into the land, which that's, we're going to, we're going to see some stuff in numbers that are going to make us question whether or not the, the nation will get there, mm -hmm. but they're going to get to the land. They're going to take possession of it. They're going to be faithful for about two seconds. Mm -hmm. Then they're not going to be faithful. And the rest of their history is pretty much them not being faithful. There are highlights. David is a highlight. Solomon is a highlight. Right. Josiah, yep. Hezekiah, under some of their kings, they have highlights. Mm -hmm. And then under, you know, Josiah and Hezekiah, after Solomon, it's really just Judah, that Judah has some has some decent kings and they they kind of try to follow. Mm -hmm. But really, they're not. They're they're ultimately not going to follow. God's going to kick them off the lab. Their land. <laughs> he's going to kick them off the land. They're going to go off into captivity. And then he's going to bring 
at least Judah, he'll bring Judah back mm -hmm. um, after 70 years. Mm -hmm. And that's the rest. That's the story. Well, and that, that's the and rest that, of the narrative. And that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the southern kingdom was the kingdom that stayed faithful to the to the uh, to the seed line of Solomon. Mm hmm. Okay, Rehoboam was the was the king after Solomon died. That's when the split happened. Right. And so the northern kingdom was always ten tribes, and the southern kingdom was always two tribes. And when they go into captivity because of their unbelief and their disobedience, he sends them to Babylon. And they're the ones that come back, and he restores them, and he ca starts calling them Israel. He doesn't call them Judah anymore. He calls them Israel after that. Because Israel has been decimated and and disseminated into the Assyrians. Right. And they become the Samaritans. Never to be called the the nation of Israel again. He calls Judah and Benjamin that nation. And uh you know, I found this text. Mm. And uh, and and Lee, if you if you just want to put it up on the screen, it's in it's in uh Jeremiah twenty nine uh and verse eleven. This is when they're in captivity. He sent them to Babylon. All right. This and this goes with this text over here. He said he said, I'm gonna the land's gonna lay it's gonna have a Sabbath rest. While you're gone, okay, and he said, but and when you're when you're uncircumcised, see the the northern kingdom never did humble their hearts. That's right. Yeah, they never did. This is after the captivity of 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 Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon taking them into captivity. He's already named the king that's going to let them go. Right. Cyrus is the king. Cyrus is not a king of Babylon. No. Cyrus is not king yet. of Persia. Yes. He's the king of Persia. Yeah. He's not a king of Babylon. Yeah. No. Well, he it's not going to be Babylon anymore. It's going to be Persia. Well, you, when he, yeah, when he takes him over. He, when he takes it over. He and takes over. He's going to be the king of Persia, and he's going to be the one that's going to let Hezekiah and, and all that, and Ezra and all them right. go back. But I want to, this is in verse 11. It says, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. What did he say in Leviticus? Only when you humble your heart. Mm -hmm. And then he says, You will seek me. Uh, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. So I'm going to, he said, I'm going to have my hand on you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to take you over there. I'm going to put you over there because you disobeyed me. And it, then when you, when you humble yourself, when you humble yourself, he said, because I got plans for you. This, this is not part of the plan. This is the plan, part of the plan, but I got more plans for you. And he said, and he said, when you seek me, he said, uh, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. I'll listen. What does it sound like? He, he's not going to listen if we're not calling to him and seeking him. That's exactly what it sounds like. You know, the guy that was born blind when he, when he, uh, uh, in John, I don't I think that chapter nine, I think is where it's it. And he says, uh, he said, you know, they, they're, they're trying to make him say that, that Jesus is a sinner and Jesus is no good. He's ungodly and he couldn't have done this. And he said, man, I don't know about any of that. He said, but I know we don't believe that God hears the prayers of a sinner. Well, th they didn't contradict that. And here God says, he said, I'm going to listen to you when, you when you seek me and listen and call me the right way. And in Isaiah 59, he says, he said, that your sins have made, you, made me hide my faith. So I don't even hear you. He won't even listen. To that kind of nonsense, is that still how he is today? Mm. To people today, is that still what he does? That that God's not listening. You're saying all these eloquent prayers, and he's not listening to you because your heart's been far from him, because your heart is consumed with yourself and with your with your doctrinal stance and your nuances of life. That you believe that that God has to love, has to be because I find them so pleasing. You know, I love this. You know, I'm a girl, and I love this other girl, and I find it so appe so appealing because I love her so much. God has to love because God's a God of love. Really, is that what you think? What if you What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? What if God has said no? That's not how I think. You know, well, would you build, be willing to bet your life on it? And it's and it's in and this is in every capacity. I mean, that's an easy one to pick up on, and I think it needs yes. to be said because of the direction our culture is headed and not just the direction it's headed, the place where it already is, yeah. right? So I think that that is a necessary example to point out and say, you know, hey, no, that's not true. Plus, there are all sorts of teachers running around saying that exactly what you just said, God is God of love, mm -hmm. God loves everyone, God is okay in your sexual debauchery and immorality, yeah. he's okay with it. And the answer is he's not. He's not okay with adultery. 
He's not okay with fornication. He's, he's not, not okay, okay with divorce. He's not okay with divorce. He's not okay with pornography. He's not okay with homosexuality. He's not okay with any of those things. All of those things are sexual immorality. But he can but he can forgive all of those things. Absolutely, and he wants to. And that's what he's telling them here. And he wants to. <laughs> all you have to do is pick up your cross and follow. We, I had a Bible study with somebody not too long ago, and I, I said that exact thing, you know, and this person was just just could not fathom in their mind that God would expect people to, despite the way they feel, not participate in that behavior. They just could not fathom. They were so upset by it. And it was like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Jesus literally says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Now, you know, when my kids ask, why, why do I have to do something? You know, when I was a kid, let me, let me go back all the way here. When I was a kid and I wanted, I wanted to know why we had to do something. And my dad would say, because I said so. Or my mom would say, because I said so. I hated that. Mm -hmm. I hated that. Ex I was like, to me, it was an excuse, right? I almost just said it, but to me, it was, it's an excuse. Like that is not good enough. I want to understand why. And so I, I'll say it this way. That is true. God has said, like, why is this the case? Because God says so. But I will also say there are a lot of blessings and benefits to pursuing life, to living life in accordance with God. There is reasoning behind it. God isn't just sitting up in the clouds going, lightning bolt, this is what I choose, right? That's not what God's doing. God has an intention and a plan, and he has had from the beginning, mm -hmm. from the beginning, the yep. depravity that we seek mm -hmm. is not life. The enemy looked at him and he said, in the garden, he said, look, just take the knowledge for yourself because then you'll be like God. Just take it for yourself because then you'll be like God, right? You determine what is right and wrong because that's what makes you like God. It doesn't make us like God. No. We are very bad at picking right and wrong. We're very bad at, at doing what leads to life, at what, recognizing what does he the say things about that the lead heart? to life. What does he say about the heart? It's more deceitful than all us, and it's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Yeah. So the so the heart is not a good a good thing to navigate through. No. It's going to lie to us. We're going to see it with Israel. Mm -hmm. We see it today. We see it today. That's what the beginning question was about. We think what leads to life is checking off all these boxes and doing all these things. And God has to be pleased with it. And God has to be pleased with whatever it may be. Maybe you're on this end of the spectrum over here and your check boxes are, you know, super well, that's, like... But that's what they're doing, Cole. They're saying, well, that every, everybody can just... We'll just let everybody go their own way and do what they think, and that's a, that will be wonderful. But what and good. I'm saying is that's legalism too. Of course, it because is. it's it's instead of your check boxes being over here and looking like this, your check boxes are over there and they look like that. You know, I don't care what your check boxes are. I don't care. It's legalism either way. Give it up. And God says no. And if you're not willing, and this is what it is at the end of the day, this is what it is. If you're not willing to give yourself up for God. I don't care where your check boxes are. If you're not willing to give yourself up for God, then you're not following him. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. No matter, no matter what you're doing. No matter what no you No matter do, what you believe. What and it doesn't matter. If yeah. you're not giving yourself up, if your dogma or ideology or whatever is so entrenched in your mind yep. that you can't come to his scriptures and lay this down and where you see differences make changes. Yeah. You know, he looked, Jesus looked at those at the end. He said in Matthew chapter seven, all these people came to him and said, Lord, I did this thing in your name and I did this. He doesn't say they tried. It says, I did these things. They prayed, they prophesied, yeah. they, they cast out demons. They did all of these things. And he's going to look at them and he say, I never knew you. Get away from me. Get away from me. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's that simple. That's what he's going to say. But that's a, that. But to many people, matter. that's an obscure verse that doesn't really mean anything to them, because he was telling us, talking to somebody else. No, he wasn't. He was talking to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to navigate through this book. We're almost we're almost through with it, but it's been a it's been a, a neat ride. It's been a telling ride, and I pray, Father, that if we learn nothing, was to learn that that your expectations of your people are to come to you with the right kind of heart and the right kind of mindset. 
help us to help us to to remember father that that uh, that you love us and you want that love from us in return help us to do that father help us to realize wh- where we today stand it's not in this law that was given to Moses for the people of Israel but we stand in the covenant of Abraham and thank you for that opportunity father because that covenant was where the gospel was first preached to Abraham through that covenant that he's going to bless all nations, and we are of all nations, Father. Thank you. Bless us. Help us to strive to love you and be obedient to you in all that you tell us to do. And we can't say thank you enough. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.